Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Science or Fiction podcast, the podcast that interviews researchers to separate the science from the fiction in news headlines. In this series, we're focusing on mental health. I'm your host, Catherine Bates. I'm a youth development researcher at King's College London, and this is the Science or Fiction podcast. First, a content warning. In this episode, we discuss mental health issues in general, specifically anxiety and depression. If you're affected by any of the issues discussed, we've included resources on our website, www.scienceorfiction.co.uk. Also, just to note that we're not talking about individual cases of mental health or other issues. Instead, we're talking about the research in general and what the evidence shows. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about mindfulness training and young people's mental health. Is there evidence behind the claim that mindfulness training improves young people's mental health? Let's find out. Mindfulness is a way of focusing on your awareness of the present moment while acknowledging thoughts, feelings and emotions that might come up. Mindfulness training is the practice of intentionally focusing that attention. And mindfulness is widely talked about and suggested as a remedy to improve various mental health issues. There's now mindfulness journals, apps and training courses. It's often suggested to help different issues such as anxiety, depression and exam stress. Research into mindfulness training or interventions has previously found to be effective in reducing symptoms of anxiety, depression and stress. Although the effects are small, meaning that anxiety symptoms might have reduced from somewhat to slightly anxious, for example, it's generally accepted that mindfulness can have a positive impact on mental health. This was until very recently. A new series of large-scale studies published in July 2022 involving hundreds of schools and thousands of young people found that mindfulness training did not improve mental health symptoms in young people. Although the research field is yet to come to a conclusion, the findings are frequently reported by the news. And this is on digital platforms and often in short articles with catchy headlines. In this format, details of the research are lost. We need to know more about the research findings to make our own conclusions and decide for ourselves what action to take. In this episode of the Science of Fiction podcast, I'm interviewing researcher Darren Dunning to get some answers. Before we introduce our guests, let's hear a few of the headlines. Mindfulness in schools does not improve mental health, study finds, Guardian, July 2022. Mindfulness studies find little benefit to all pupils, BBC, July 2022. So I'm super excited to welcome our guest today, Darren Dunning. Hi, Darren. Welcome to the podcast. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Um, So before we get started, can you tell us a bit about what you do? Okay, I've changed jobs really well fairly recently um now a senior research advisor for the national institute for health research so if someone's thinking about putting in a research proposal they might speak to someone like me about how to advise them on research design or actually any aspect of the research pro- process um more pertinent to what we're going to talk about before then until a few months ago i was an investigator scientist at the cognition and brain sciences unit which is part of cambridge university where i researched among other things, improving the mental health of young people with mindfulness training. Okay, so let's get started. What does a typical mindfulness intervention or mindfulness training for young people look like? Okay, so for teenagers and young people, really, it's quite short. It will be an hour per week, maybe, a lesson of an hour a week, some are longer, some are shorter. And the lessons would usually be in small groups and consist of focusing their attention on something like the breath and treating the inevitable intrusive thoughts with an attitude of curiosity and acceptance. So when you do get these thoughts, which happen all the time, you can't really stop stop those. You get better at returning your focus to your breath. For smaller children, the idea is very much the same, but it's just framed in a different way. So there was one study with children as young as four and they, again, were focusing on the breath. At the same time, we're rocking a cuddly toy to sleep. So it's, and the, the idea of the intrusive thought would be a bit too much, I think. So you would just focus on being in the now rather than trying to, you know, overcomplicate things. 
in terms of what they are for so for young people or adolescents um why might we use mindfulness training so the news articles often talk about how it's um to improve mental health in general but obviously we know that mental health is not one thing so what's it normally directed towards okay so mindfulness itself has been around for thousands of years um but mindfulness training has been around for about 35 and it was initially designed to reduce stress and prevent reoccurrence of depression. So if someone had been depressed before, this was, this was a good way of making sure that they didn't go back there again. More recently, it's been used to improve things like um, learning and behaviour. For me, I think it's best used to reduce um, stress and anxiety and depression. If you think of it, this is, this is a really oversimplified way of looking at mental health, by the way. But if you think of anxiety as worrying about things that haven't happened yet, so being fixated on the future, and an aspect of depression is being stuck in the past, so ruminating on things that have happened that you can't change. If you think of that, of, of mental health problems in those way, in, in that sort of way, then being in the present would be a good place to be because then you're not thinking of the future, you're not dwelling on the past. So we, a, a, a nice way of describing it is we say you control your mental time travel. So you're not going to worry about things that haven't happened yet if you're able to bring yourself back to now. I think that's, that's the best way of using mindfulness. That's a really nice way to think about it, like bringing into the moment um, rather than worrying about different things that you essentially can't control, like the future yeah. and the yeah. past. There's a caveat, I suppose, to, to that, that if you're depressed and now is a really bad place to be, then maybe mindfulness is not the right thing to do. But it's really good if you're feeling a bit sad or a bit anxious, I would, I would say. So it, it could depend on the context and on the individual person. Absolutely, yeah. So um, what are like the most important research findings that we should know about mindfulness training and young people's mental health at the moment? Okay, so mindfulness research is um, consistent in its inconsistency, I would say. That, um, so early research focused on very, very small trials, and the results were generally positive. But as, as you mentioned more recently, that um, there's been bigger trials of mindfulness. And these have shown a really mixed set of results. The biggest study to date was when I was... I was um, I was involved in the team. I wasn't, I wasn't involved in the, the main team that were collecting the data and writing the papers and stuff, but I was involved in the Myriad trial. In the Myriad trials, um, the biggest study of mindfulness to date, um, this is the one that really produced all the headlines. So there was 8,000 children aged between 11 and 14 that randomized to either mindfulness or a control group. Basically what that study showed was that mindfulness was not superior to doing nothing essentially and uh, it was a passive control so they were actually doing anything so there was there was no real benefit of um mindfulness for really depression anxiety or well-being but there's a few caveats that i think that we can probably talk about later in the podcast okay brilliant so one of the most important research findings here is that in the recent uh, studies that have involved like thousands of young people, we're now seeing that mindfulness training is not having um, a substantial effect on um, anxiety and depression in young people. So I think that brings us on nicely to the part of the episode where we dive into the research behind a headline. And this week, we're going to cover um, the research from you and your team that has been covered in the following news articles. Mindfulness in schools does not improve mental health, study finds, Guardian, July 2022. Mindfulness studies find little benefit to all pupils, BBC, July 2022. So you touched on um, some of these findings already, but just to put it into context, there was a series of studies that was published in um, a journal, the Evidence-Based Mental Health Journal, about this huge trial. Um, so one of your papers in this series um, was an updated meta-analysis of trials looking at the effectiveness of mindfulness-based programs in improving mental health. 
Can you just first explain to us what a meta-analysis is and summarise the findings uh, from this paper? Absolutely. So a meta-analysis is a way of analysing the results of multiple scientific studies together. So instead of looking at lots of small studies, you put them into one big pot and you can look at them as one. So in this way, you get a good overview of the field. Um, a key feature of the meta-analysis, though, is that you've got to You've all the, all these studies that go into the one analysis have got to be similar in some way. So all the studies that we picked for the meta analysis were randomised control trials. And a randomised control trial is essentially a trial where, in this case, mindfulness was compared against a control condition, um, and the participants that were included in the studies were randomised to condition. So the the young young people had to be under under 18 years of age as well. They were assessed, randomized to either mindfulness or controls, then assessed again. We ended up with 66 of these studies, which um, equipped to about 20,000 young people. Um, the results are quite complicated. We looked at, you know, we, we had hundreds of analyses in there. Um, we've got, so the paper itself is quite short, but then we've got a, what's called a supplemental material section where we add all this stuff to it. And that's over hundred pages long. It's this book of, um, yeah, mind, mindfulness. If, if, if you're interested in details, that's the place to, to look. Um, but the, I think the take home message from the measure analysis was that it was effective in improving the, the mindfulness rather was, in, was it effective in improving anxiety and stress, attention, executive functioning and negative and social behavior. That was only compared to passive control groups. So, you know, groups didn't do anything. When you compared mindfulness against active control groups, then it was only effective in improving anxiety and stress. So, very limited evidence. The conclusion really was that um, the the enthusiasm for mindfulness, the excitement behind it, this the, this will be the next big thing. This would be the answer has moved ahead of the evidence. So the evidence doesn't really back up that mindfulness is, is effective. That's um, really interesting. So just to unpick it a little bit, you said that there was some finding that mindfulness can improve anxiety. Is this quite small effects? Like why, why can we not run with that and, and you yeah. know, give it to everyone that has anxiety? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I mean, there's no reason that we couldn't, I suppose, in a way. But the, the effects of mindfulness are always tend to be quite small anyway. Talking of effect sizes, we're not, we're not going to see a big improvement. Essentially, okay. in, in most ca cases, it will be quite, um, quite small. Yeah, okay. You said about the difference between active and passive control groups. So passive, where they essentially don't do anything different, and active, they usually do like another type of program. So what's That's like right. an example of um, an active control group in this case? Like what might they do? Okay, so it's a, it's a really important distinction that the the difference between you know essentially doing nothing and engaging in another training program. So in one of the myriad studies that I was involved in, it's, it's also in that issue of evidence-based mental health. We had 500 kids and we randomized them to either mindfulness or an active control group. And this was something called student success skills. So it was, it was an evidence-based intervention that taught things like note-taking, memory techniques, and things like that. So things that would be important for, the, for, for our kids to you know, to use and to learn. But crucially, what generally tends to happen when, when you would use an active control group, you would hope to train a different set of skills that you would be than you would with mind, mindfulness. So mindfulness, we were predicting that it would improve mental health skills and um, student success skills wouldn't improve those areas, but it might improve things like learning. So what was found in that in that study with the 500 kids? Yeah, well, again, we didn't find any benefit of mindfulness over, over the control group. Yeah, yeah. okay. We also looked at the same trial. We looked, um, we were lucky in the fact that we finished data collection just 
before COVID struck. It also gave us the opportunity to then to conduct um, another study using the same kids, looking at their mental health as a result of the lockdown, as a result of COVID. And if mindfulness had served as a sort of protective factor, and um, again, we didn't find that it did. We did find that the people that had been through the mindfulness training thought that it, it, it helped them, but, but there was no evidence in mental health. The sad thing maybe is that we looked at mental health during lockdown and that fell off a cliff. People were really sort of, you know, um, elevated ratings of anxiety and depression as a, as a result of that was really, it was, it was a hard time for a lot of people, obviously. Yeah, I think we're seeing lots of research like that now and it's, yeah, it's, it's really difficult. And I guess it also, you know, is related to this. What are the clinical implications of this understanding that we now have? So should we not be encouraging young people um, with anxiety or stress symptoms to be trying mindfulness? Should we be directing resources elsewhere? Well, we would normally say that mindfulness is better used as a tool for prevention. Um, so someone who's clinically depressed might be not in the right mind frame to focus their attention for an extended period of time. Um, so I think I mentioned this earlier on that if being in the now is not a good place to be, then maybe mindfulness is not good for, for those that are in episode who are really, really depressed. I think, um, you know, evidence, it's pretty strong evidence that it's useful for preventing anxiety or helping symptoms of anxiety that um, I think I, th I think it's a good thing I would recommend it but one thing that isn't widely, widely reported that people don't talk about very very much it's pretty difficult I think my office is quite tough and it takes a lot of practice and the idea that we need to just concentrate on our breathing is, sounds like it's really, really you know, the most simple thing in the world well I can breathe I'll, I'll just do that yeah but, but, but it's, it's really difficult so um, I went through mindfulness before I started researching mindfulness. I was quite sort of on the fence about it, really. I went through a mindfulness course that was um, quite intensive. It was lots of lots of home practice and things like that as well. And I realised that focusing on the breathing or whatever or sounds around you, or whatever it might be, is that doesn't seem so difficult but what happens is you, you still get the intrusive thoughts so I was still starting to think that you know I would well what, what I had to do next week or you know I was that these thoughts were, were happening non-stop at the same rate that they always do and I spoke to my my instructor and I said I said I'm terrible at this I I, I can't do it I keep thinking about other things. He goes, well, of course, of course you do. I was like, okay. He goes, but what you do is if your mind wanders a thousand times, you bring it back a thousand times. So rather than getting better at increasing your attention span, I think what it does, it gets you better at switching your attention back to where it should be. So it's, it's actually pretty difficult. So I think it's a commitment from the person who's going to practice it, that, that they need to do it more than an hour a week, for instance, they need to do it for an extended period of time for, for it to, to be effective. But I would certainly recommend it for something like anxiety. So in terms of pre prevention, um, if we think about like specific contexts like exam stress that we know a lot of young people go through or anxiety around exams, potentially if you know you've got a period like that coming up and you're interested in mindfulness and you'd be motivated to do the learning and the training with it 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 could be helpful for you if if you you know spend the time on it like in advance of being in you know the the panic or the the actual an anxious period yeah I, th I think i think that's 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 a good way of putting it but but there's a real need to focus your attention you know, constantly not, not, you know, listen to an app and just hope it's going to make you mindful. I think you've got to be, it's a real con, conscious effort to focus your attention and keep doing it. I'm 
practice often, even if it's only for 15 minutes a day, keep on practicing and you will get better. And I think it'd be useful for things like stress. Kind of bringing it back to the findings from the meta-analysis, can we maybe conclude that rolling out mindfulness training for every young person um, at school to try and help with mental health, like anxiety and depression, is maybe not the best use of those resources? I would say that I would I would agree with that. And I, I think we've worked a lot with typical groups. And, you know, I think a good name for a paper would be you can take a, a person to mindfulness class, but you can't make them mindful. It's it needs <laughs> yeah. to be it needs to be something, something more. And just giving a sort of off the peg, there you go, there's some mindfulness to help with your stress is not going to work for most for most people. It, it would work for, for some, but it's much more of a commitment, in my opinion. I guess I just want to quickly pick up on um, why in some previous studies, like you mentioned small sample sizes, for, for example. So why um, in the meta-analysis are there studies that where some find a reduction in anxiety following mindfulness training and some don't? Like what are some of the reasons why that might happen? Yeah. So, what there's a there's a, a key a key thing with a lot of mindfulness studies that don't the researchers don't use a version of mind they use their version of mindfulness. So we'll we'll have subtle differences. Um, duration is also an issue. That you know, I think in our our study we we found that. Some were as short as two hours, some were as long as 40 hours. So that's going to have, have um, an impact as well. Um, and if you think about how mindfulness is supposed to work, um, you'd say it would improve your attentional control, maybe. So attentional control is part of a suite of skills called executive func functions. And these are measured different times in a person's life. So the ability to inhibit, so to block out things that aren't important, happens when you're quite young. But things like um, sort of mental flexibility, so that kind of switching back, that happens much, much later. So it might work in very different ways for different people, especially at, at younger ages. It's, um, it's certainly not a... a, a as, as, as I said, a one-size-fits-all. The meta-analysis showed that um, ratings of anxiety, stress, social behaviour were better in younger participants. Those things like well-being and executive functions were better in older ones. So, yeah, the, the idea that it works in the same way for everyone, I think, is one that we need to move away from. And, yeah, I guess it makes sense that while uh, different skills are developing at different ages, these types of training or interventions could be having a different effect, which is, like you said, again, why a one, part, uh, one size fits all or rolling out training for an entire school in mindfulness is, is, is not going to have the kind of outcomes that you might hope it would. I don't think it would, in my opinion. No, that's yeah. right. So where should we go next with this research? Um, what do we what do we need to study to better understand whether mindfulness training is effective for young people? That's such an important question. You know, really think thanks thanks for asking it. Is that what we shouldn't do is say, well, mindfulness doesn't work. Let's stop. Let's stop our research. Let's stop doing it. But, but what happens is that we do see these studies, these big. Mindfulness, which was a which is a really big, um, you know, it took a lot of time and resources, um, and then that means funders in the future will go well. We, you know, um, they are less keen in putting money in into funding. But what we need to do is unpack mindfulness and see why it doesn't work. And for the kids in the Myriad trial, what we found was they would. They were quite happy to come to class to do that hour per, per week. That was fine. What they wouldn't then do was go home and do the homework. 
they didn't do any practice at, at, at all. Um, so I think expecting them to make big improvements after after eight hours of mindfulness training over two two months was expecting a bit much. Um, I mean, there's already lots of kind of competing things on our attention on, on attention on you know, Netflix and smartphones. You know, everyone's everyone does the same thing or watch watch the TV at the same time as the looking up which actor stars in that film on on the phone. You know, so I think that we've got a lot of competing things on our attention and um, mindfulness. It seemed mindfulness practice was just another thing that they had to do and the, the kids in, in, in our city didn't end up doing it. I also think that we're missing a trick. My, I always thought that, 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 we're, that we're missing a trick in that we teach people how to be mindful, that's all well and good, but then we don't really teach them how to use that flexibly in, in situations that when they might need it, such as when they're anxious or, or, or a bit sad, we just expect them to make that jump. We say, well, if you have these intrusive thoughts, then treat them as such and then, you know, bring attention back to the present. It's a skill that needs, needs, needs to be practiced and, and these kids weren't doing it. They were just doing an hour a week and we didn't see any effects. In terms of how important the practice was and how the practice uh, young people in the Myriad trial were not practicing as much. I guess it comes back to how much we already ask of young people. So young people at school and of this age are just under so much pressure and, you know, undergoing crazy development and moving forward with like making friends and um, trying to do well in exams and stuff. And is it actually realistic for us to be like, okay, to solve this is issue, you need to commit to X, Y, Z. Um, but then I'm not sure what the alternative is. But yeah. like you said, it's important to look further into um, why that, why it might have been that it wasn't effective and it could be that um, we do just need, you know, more practice and training. Yeah, it's it's, it's such, such a difficult time. I think I think that you know that sort of you know the um, adolescence is such a difficult time anyway. Trying to squeeze in something else is is you know you know what it, you know it might be beneficial, but um, it's also a big big undertaking. So yeah, I can I can absolutely understand why people don't want to add another. Well, you need to practice for an extra sort of on a thirty minutes a day. Add that onto you know I already sort of um, work workload you know. Um, homework and revision and whatnot yeah yeah exactly do you have any recommendations for listeners who want to find out more about this topic okay so i think the um resource section of the oxford mindfulness center's website's really good it's got lots of good recommendations for books and lots of videos if you want to start start your practice and the and the um the the practice is led by um, mark williams who's like one of the founding fathers of mind, mindfulness, a fantastic um, guy. Um, more generally, there's a book um, called Losing All Minds, What Mental Illness Really Is and What It Isn't by Lucy Fox. I think it's a great book at explaining the challenges that young people face around mental health difficulties. I think as a general book, that would, that's one that I would recommend. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so finally, the impossible question, mm -hmm. <laughs> technically unanswerable. Mindfulness does not improve young people's mental health. Is it science or fiction? Okay, love. I have to say fiction. The meta-analysis shows good evidence that mindfulness training is useful in improving anxiety, at least. And that's against active control groups, which is the biggest real test you can have. Um, that said, I can say with a degree of certainty that mindfulness was not as effective as we thought it would be and definitely not as effective as we'd like it to be. Yeah, I guess I, I kind of didn't know what to expect with your answer because as we talked about before, like the Myriad trial, like my, um, mindfulness training, randomized control trial, that's where these headlines have come from where there was no effect on anxiety. But um, as we've kind of covered in this podcast episode, there's actually 
a lot of nuances that need to be looked into. And as you said, in the meta-analyses overall, there are effects of mindfulness training on anxiety. And it can depend on the context. It can depend on the amount of training that's done and different subgroups of young people. So, yeah, as you mentioned previously, it sounds like we need to do a bit more research to fully understand how this works. Exactly. I think the headline that mindfulness works under some circumstances and some, you know, it, 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 or, you know, mindfulness works a bit, you know, that isn't, isn't the headline, is it really? It's just a, whereas mindfulness doesn't work as a, a sort of a quite a, a nice headline it gets the gets the clicks but i think that as you said it's much more nuanced the actual story definitely and that kind of headline is way less exciting which is the whole point of having this conversation so we can figure out um what's actually going on in the research behind the headline Absolutely. cool thank you so much no that was a pleasure um can i come back <laughs> yes you can come back Brilliant. you need to publish another article that gets uh taken taken on by the media with loads of controversial uh, headlines and then you can back. Back. i can do that i can do that that's fine brilliant thank you so much again to darren for coming on to the podcast today and thank you all for listening you can follow us for updates and more information on instagram and tiktok at science or fiction pod and on twitter at sci or fiction pod if you want to get in touch or if you have a suggestion for a future topic, you can email us at info at scienceorfiction.co.uk. And as always, you can find the researcher recommendation and some links to mental health resources at www.scienceorfiction.co.uk. Finally, I'd like to thank King's College London and the Wellcome Trust Public Engagement Grant for funding this series on youth mental health. Thank you to Afra Din for helping to produce this episode. Thank you to Kit Studio for the branding and to Jamie Johnson for the music. See you next week.